Good morning. Welcome to Christ Chapel. We're so glad you're with us, whether you're here in person or online. Thank you for joining us today. And uh, and our service today will be about an hour and 15 minutes. So we will have some music, a message, and we are taking prayer requests. So if you're online, if you could put those in the comment section in the next 30, 45 minutes, that way they have time to get those sent over to me and we can present them to the congregation. If you're here, we'll ask for those at that, at that time. Well, Friday was Veterans Day, so we want to honor our veterans. So I do have a clip for us as we uh, just show our respect and thank them for their service. service this morning. God, we thank you for those who are serving and have served. We ask, oh God, that you continue to bless them, provide for them, take care of their needs. And God, we are just grateful uh, for the uh, nation that we have and for those who have, have served to help us to continue on as a great nation to follow after you. So God, we just ask your continued blessings on them and also on our service, oh God, that everything that's said and done this morning That'll be to your glory and to your honor and prepare our hearts for what you have for us today. And we thank you, God, in Jesus' name. Amen. amen. This time our music team will come forward if you'll stand and join us in singing. Jesus, Lord, you're worthy of all the 
team thank you for such a beautiful time of praise and adoration to God and the, just the, all your hard work it's so grateful to have you as part of our team as we bring our glory and honor to God you guys did a great job so with the title that's called making the most of our your walk with God it can almost be one of those that you feel like it's going to be you know this is what you should do but anytime you have someone point fingers, you have to remember there's three pointing back. So hopefully instead of it feeling like it's a, a thing of what you have to do, hopefully it's more of an encouragement and instructional as we just think about the things that God has for us and what God has done for us. So we're going to look at the why, the how, and the results of making the most of our walk with God. And the Apostle Paul, he writes to the Colossians and in this opening chapter, it's a beautiful passage that he has written, and he just starts by letting them know the importance of walking with God and uh, gives us some instruction on how to do that. And as we look at the verses, when we get into it, you'll see that it starts out, for this reason, and we got, well, what reason is he talking about? So we'll go up to the beginning of the chapter of Colossians 1, and just to recap it for you, is the Apostle Paul has heard of their faith and love for God that their work has borne fruit, and that they have faithful ministers who are helping them low, uh, grow in the things of God. So that's what he's saying, for this reason, because you have already believed, because you have fruit, because you have those who are leading you, then this is some other things I want to write to you to instruct you about. So it's in Colossians 1, and verses 9 through 14. It says, for this reason, since the day we heard about you, we have not stopped praying for you, we continually ask God to fill you with the knowledge of his will through all the wisdom and understanding that the Spirit gives, so that you may live a life worthy of the Lord and please him in every way, bearing fruit in every good work, growing in the knowledge of God, being strengthened with all power according to his glorious might, so that you may have great endurance and patience, and giving joyful thanks to the Father who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of his holy people in the kingdom of light. For he has rescued us from the dominion of darkness and brought us in the kingdom of his son he loves, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. It's a great passage. There's a lot of information in there, and we're going to look at just some of those truths to help us know how can we better follow through with our walk with God? How can we make the most of our walk with God? And as we begin this, we're told that we are to live a life that can be pleasing unto God. That's tough. Then he says, we're going to be worthy of God. It's like, how are we worthy of God? But it just lets us know that as we allow God to work in our life, as we begin this walk, that we will have those things happening, where then we please God. We are worthy of all the, that we receive from God. And when we think of God's will, we also tend to think that, because that's what it's going to do is we follow God. We get the will of God. We understand the will of God for our life. And as we start thinking about this will of God, we start thinking it's the things we don't want to do. When I was in college, that was one of the things they would we'd joke about. It's like, well, you know, if you want to minister in Hawaii, you better tell God you don't want to go there. <laughs> or don't ever say, God, I don't want to go to Timbuktu because that's where you'll go. We always made it where anything you didn't want to do, that's what God's will would be for you. Well, that's so wrong. God wants the best for us. God wants to put us where we need to be. But we start looking at, well, then why are we following God? What are the reasons to walk with God? And so the Apostle Paul, he starts out with this. And so we're going to bounce down, actually, to the last two verses we read, verses 13 and 14, and then we'll bounce back up to the top. But as we look at those last two verses, he explains to us why we would want to walk with God at all. And the first thing he tells us is that Jesus has rescued us. Jesus has rescued us. So that should encourage us to want to walk with God just because we know Jesus has rescued us from this sinful nature. 
all of us were born with a sin nature. I know there's those who don't believe that or they're trying to think, well, no, we aren't. But how many have seen a toddler who just gets defiant? That's not a learned behavior. That's something of just who toddlers are. And we know it's a part of our nature. So when we start even looking at as a child, they also, what's the first word they learn? One of the first words is mine. Mine, mine, mine. And through all our life, we deal with mine, mine, mine. And we start getting that selfishness. So we understand this is a part of who we are. And we also know that in our day and time, people don't like the word sin. Some don't, well, we've been beat up by the word sin, I guess is why, but that's why a lot of times I'll use things of doing things that are unloving or things that we know are wrong rather than the word sin because the word sin might, does offend and some people shut you out when they hear that word sin because they just assume where you're going with it. But the Bible does use the word. And we're told in Romans 6, 23, for the wages of sin, unloving behavior, doing wrong, is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Jesus Christ our Lord. So we are told that the wages of sin has the death penalty attached. That's harsh. And we think, well, what I did wasn't all that wrong. Why would it be the death penalty? Have you looked at the Hebrew scriptures? Have you looked at the law of Moses? Every sin committed required death. It may not be your own, but it was a slaughter of an animal. It was somewhere death had to be pay the penalty for it. And so we realize that, that because Jesus has rescued us, then we can be grateful for what God has done. And so we thank God for it. And that is why we want to walk with God, because we have been rescued. Now, I haven't had a dog in my household for many, many years, but the last dog I had was a, a rescue. She was a Springer Spaniel. She was a beautiful dog, dense as a brick but she was just as sweet as could be. But her being a rescue, she had been just horribly abused. And then she came into my life, and all of a sudden she globbed onto me like crazy. And because she knew she was saved from that bad life and has now a pretty good life, it didn't take her long to understand that, that although she was still jumpy and at times just plain weird, she was the most loving animal. She would do what she could to please you know, the things we expect, go do business where they're supposed to do the business unless they're jumpy or nervous or scared. Times that she would make sure you knew that the mail had arrived. But then there were those other times of where she knew I was having a bad day and she would just come put her head on my leg and just stare at me with those eyes just saying, I care, I'm concerned for you too. And it's just those ways of wanting to please. And here's a dog that wasn't too smart, but she knew. I mean, she always knew when, what I needed, and she'd be right there next to me, sometimes too close. In fact, one day I came home, and she came running out the door and started winding through my legs, and I went tumbling down. But she was just a type of a, a dog. So I'm sure she may not have remembered everything of her past, but she knew that life was now good. And even if I had to discipline her, she knew that I cared for her and loved her. Now, if a neurotic dog could understand that she has been rescued and is living a better life and does what she can to give thanks, how much more should we, who are hopefully more intelligent than that poor blessed little dog I had, uh, that we understand as well that God has rescued us. God has redeemed us. God has saved us. And so we should be grateful for what God has done. That word rescue carried with it the idea of from a condemned state of being. It also carries the word of deliverance. Now, I don't know about some of the circles, Christian circles you ran around in, but anytime someone would talk about a deliverance ministry, red flags start popping up everywhere <laughs> because there was just always those things of bow, foul, spirit of nicotine, come out. I mean, you know, you guys had to go through that. And I'm not so sure it was a demon as much as just an addiction. But still, and God will help us with those addictions, thank God. But I don't think it was a demon. So anytime we hear the word deliverance, we get scared. But what has he delivered us from? That dominion of darkness into the marvelous light. The King James Version uses the words, the power of darkness, meaning that control over our lives, that which we really had no power over, it was just over us. 
from our very beginning. That whole me, me, me attitude has always been there. And it's a condition of people without Christ. And whether we know it or not, we really do need brought into this kingdom of light. The idea is we are in a kingdom that's opposed to the things of God. This kingdom of, of, of power of darkness over us means that we have no way out on our own. We're held captive. That's where that rescue comes in. But also realizing that it indicates that in a way we're enemies with God. And we may think, well, I've got no issue with God. I've never had an issue with God. I may not believe in God. It may not be what I want in my life, but I don't have an issue. But we're still at enemies with God. If we just bring it to a level we can understand, our nation has other nations who are considered our enemies at times. Me as a person, I'm not their enemy. But my relation to the United States, I'm their enemy. And that's kind of how it is. We are in this dominion of darkness, and so we may not have the issue, but that dominion in which we're living does, and so it means we are enemies with God. And that's why we needed Christ to help to redeem us and rescue us from it, which is the next word that we look at, that, uh, that word redemption. As we look at that word redemption, it go, going back again to Romans 3 where I read the wages of sin is death, the gift of God is eternal life and through Jesus Christ our Lord. Then Romans 3.24 tells us, and all are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. So here the word redemption in Colossians and in Romans is actually a term that was taken from the slave market of that day. And what a redemption was, was a person being bought out of slavery and then allowed to go free. That was redemption. And so he uses that which he has, not that he's ever condoning slavery at all, he's just using an example that people saw and understood that if you were redeemed, you were bought out of captive and just set free. And that's what he wants us to see, that we are set free from this darkness, from this sin nature, the things that controlled us, that was over us, and made, gave us liberty. Now, that doesn't mean we won't ever sin again. Any of us who's walked with Christ for any length of time know that's true. But we realize that we are being made into God's image more and more as we keep following Christ. Jesus is giving us that divine nature. And we're being made in Christ's image not in self, some self-righteous, pious image that some people try to reflect. We're made into the image of the Christ of the Bible, not the Christ that some people have created and presented to the world. So this redemption means that, yeah, we have accepted the fact that we are free from that bondage. Yes, we're able to sin, and we shouldn't willfully sin. It shouldn't be something that we go running into, but if we are into a stage of sin, we don't have to fear being kicked out of the kingdom forever. We are brought in permanently into the household of God. So no, we don't live like the devil and want to follow God. Rather, we should be following after the things of God and allowing God to work in our life. But those are probably the important reasons. Those are two of the most important reasons. Why do we even want to walk with Christ? Well, look what God has done for us. And if a neurotic dog can understand that she should be loving and caring to the one who rescued her, how much more should we be loving and caring to the God who saved us for all eternity? And then we need to research, well, how do we walk with God? How to walk with God? <clears throat> Paul's statement now directs us on doing God's will, basically, which is doing God's will. You're walking it with God. So now we're going to jump back up to verse 9 and to the beginning of the passage. And our walk with God is not just what we, um, what we do when we're thinking about God or when we're at church. It's our everyday life should be a walk with God. Our walk with God is, is where we see that, that Paul is starting to tell us. He's, he's, this section is actually part of a prayer that he has for us. And he's showing us in his prayer things that we can look for in our own life. So in, in doing these things of God, as we constantly are in prayer, as he says, the first thing he tells us is, I pray for you continually. As we keep prayer in our life, we're seeking God's will for our life. And he's praying for them, that they be filled 
with the knowledge of his will. Do you pray for that for yourself? The Lord's Prayer is, part of it is, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And any time I pray the Lord's Prayer, I say, God, your will be done in my life as you will. In our church as you will. There's those things of praying for God's will to happen in our life. And also, since he prayed it for the Colossians, we should be praying it for one another. That as we lift up one another in prayer, that we think about these things of God, what is your will for them? Guide them. And as he says, it's a nonstop prayer for the Colossians. We shouldn't think that we can do better without God. Each and every day, we need to seek God. Do we start our day asking God, what is your direction? What do you want to happen today? How do you want to lead my life? And sometimes when we do things that, based on our own wisdom, that we do without taking it to prayer, can lead to some not-so-great circumstances. God knows circumstances better than we do. And God will intervene sometimes, even when we don't expect God to, But there are times that as we are praying, all of a sudden our idea is like, maybe that's not the best idea. Things start coming to our thoughts and minds and thinking, maybe there's a different way I should go about this. But how often have we ended up in trouble because we haven't talked to God about it? Even Israel, when they took over the promised land, one of the first things they did was they made a pact with a group of people that they thought were from a distant land and come to find out they were neighbors, but... Once they had made that agreement, they had that thorn in their flesh for centuries. So we can see that as well, that we may need to have conse- or get consequences for some of our actions we do, but are we taking things to God in prayer? And 1 Thessalonians 5.17 just simply says, pray continually. It's an important part of our life. When we walk with God, we know this stuff. It's not anything we don't know, but we need to be reminded at times that we need prayer to be a part of our life. It's prayer that helps us see that our spirituality is not something that's just in a car, uh, compartmentalized, that in this time, in this day, I do this. But prayer continually means that as I go through my day, things come to mind. As things cross our path, we bring those to God in prayer as well. And it should be just about everything in our life. And the reason we need prayer is um, in every aspect of our life is because the enemy of our soul is aware of those areas of our life where we've not allowed God in. I've seen that in our LGBTQ community a lot, is that we haven't given God that part of our life because a group of people have said, God doesn't agree with this, God's not a part of that. So we've kind of just separated that part from our spiritual walk and from everything else in life and so we've had uh, this other way that we're going and it's led us into some areas maybe we shouldn't go and so we start having to think God will I bring you into that and and I've seen where those who haven't allowed God to be a part of their orientation of who God created them to be that all of a sudden it starts chipping away at their faith on other things those who are gung-ho for God, those who have seen God work in their life, all of a sudden the doubts and the uncertainties crept in and it just chips away. So that's why we don't want to allow that. That's why we want to stay in prayer with God to help us hear God's voice and God's word, which leads to the next part where he talks about things that help us know God's will. He states about spiritual wisdom and understanding. Spiritual wisdom and understanding is that we start growing in the knowledge of God, that we start understanding more about God. We know our best tool for understanding God is the Bible. See, these are basic truths we should know, but are we practicing them daily? The Bible gives us those understandings of God, and yes, God has revealed things about God in different ways, aspects in different ways whether it's in nature through other people different ways but the scripture has been given to us and the reason it is such a a honored book is not so much that we live in the history of it but we learn from the history of how people who were normal people like us 
came from being flawed people to being powerful people in the kingdom of God. Those principles are still there, whether the story is different, things that happen are different in life. God uses it to reveal, the scripture to reveal more and more of how God operates. And as we learn how God operates, then we can start putting it into our life. Spiritual wisdom and understanding may be done differently in our own life than what we may even think as well. God will put things in our heart that we just like, this doesn't even make sense. And that's why it's sometimes called a leap of faith. There are things that God puts in our hearts that logically doesn't make sense. Why would anyone give up this to do that? Why would anyone give of their offerings to God and, and whenever they're having a hard time making ends meet? They put God first. Those are the things that we don't understand, but as we start learning spiritual wisdom and understanding, then all of a sudden those things start making sense of realizing, oh, God is in this, and God can work through it in ways I may not expect. We just need to know the heart of God. What is God speaking to us? Now, we're going to not read the whole section, but Judges 6 and 7 is a great story. In fact, you may want to make note of those passages and read it later, but it's a great story in Judges chapter 7. We're told about a mighty deliverance God brought through Gideon. Gideon was a man who was the lowest in his family of the lowest tribe of Israel. They were like the, the, the last person that would ever be expected to be put into a position of authority and power, and God speaks to him. He doesn't have confidence in himself either. So he seeks God's direction, and over and over he's asking for God to confirm what he has been told, and finally he responds to the voice of God, and somehow, some way, he's able to get 32,000 people together, warriors together, to fight this army that is trying to defeat Israel. 32,000. And God says, get in, you got too many people. So he says, tell those who are afraid to go home. Now, you can imagine that be, you know, a few people would be afraid and want to go home. And all of a sudden, he announces, if you're afraid, you can leave. And so first few people start picking up their things and getting ready, and they start walking. And all of a sudden, others start picking up their things. And 22,000 people were scared and left. Over two-thirds of his army was afraid. So he's left with 10,000. He's like, all right, we'll do what we have with what we got. And God said, you still got too many. What do you mean you got too many? So God gave him a test. And through the test, there were 9,700 in this camp and 300 in this camp. And he's like, I don't know why 300 make a difference. 9,700, 10,000, is it really that big a deal? And God said, no, no, no. You send the 9,700 home, you keep the three. And he's like, but this is an army that's across locusts over the whole land. They are just everywhere. And 300 people? Yeah. And what I want you to fight with is a torch, a jar, and a trumpet. That is your weapons of war. Uh, God, evidently you haven't seen battle before. Because <laughs> those aren't things that win a battle. But God was saying, the way you think, the way you want it done gives you honor and glory. But this gives honor and glory unto God. It takes faith to step out. That's why I think he had to keep going back to God. God, are you sure? Are you sure? And it's okay for us to see, keep asking God for those uh, confirmations within our life. But sometimes doing what God pleases or God desires for our life doesn't make sense with those things around us. It can seem so foolish. But will we step out in faith? So that's why we need to seek God's spiritual wisdom and understanding and knowing God's desire. So how do we know God's will? How will we know if we're doing the right thing? I mean, this is, you know, we can get some pretty strange ideas. In fact, banks won't hardly loan to churches anymore because too many pastors stepped out in faith and blown. So we get it. We know. It's like, God, how do we know? Well, it's pretty simple. Yes, we've already talked about prayer. We talked about the Bible. And then is there that still small voice within your heart? But sometimes we can make some pretty bad decisions on just on feelings. That's why we need confirmation. So God's also given us other believers, other people 
that can help encourage us and give us wisdom that we may not have thought of. That's why I'm so grateful for the leadership we have of our church, because it's not just my ideas, because my ideas, sometimes they have to shut down and say, no, Pastor, I don't think that will work. But there's things that we need that we have everyone together that makes it better, and it helps us listen to the voice of God. And not only that, then circumstances as well. There are things that we have gone barreling through thinking this is where God wants us to go and all of a sudden that door closed. But God opens another one. God shows us a different way. Those are things that help us get confirmation. But as scripture tells us, make sure you get two or three witnesses to everything that you feel is of God. That's one of those harebrained ideas that some people have. Probably haven't had the two or three witnesses. It just felt good. It sounded good. So they went with it. So that's where we, again, start allowing God to speak to us and to our hearts. And as we allow the spiritual wisdom and understanding to grow, we develop into who God wants us to be, which gets us to the last part, the results of walking with God. Verses 10 through 12, we actually see five different results, and I'll hit them all quickly so it won't be here forever. But the Apostle Paul, he starts out by saying, and to live a life worthy of the Lord. Live a worthy life. That is a tall order. That's a big result. And we start thinking, God, how can we do that? I mean, we even see that with, other, with our friends sometimes. Oh, she is too good for that person that you're dating. We're all worried about them. And there's people who have said that, oh, they're not holy enough to be following after God. Thankfully, that's not one else's right to decide. But what God does is through the Holy Spirit reveals things in our heart and life that we are children of God. We are permanent residents with God. And again, if we're living like the devil, we need to go back to that spiritual wisdom and understanding. But as we mature in Christ, we start looking more and more like this Christ that we serve. And in ourselves, we know we'll never fully attain to being worthy of Christ's death and resurrection. But can live as a child of the king. As we live as a child of the king, we're going to face things differently. Instead of feeling beat up by the world, we know we are serving the God of all creation and we can hold our head up high and go through some circumstances of life that may not be easy. And yes, as we are becoming worthy to live, to live for the Lord like this, we realize the Holy Spirit's going to start dealing with stuff. And I know when God starts dealing with my weaknesses, I'm not all that thrilled about it. But I know in the end, it'll be better for me and my relationship with God. There are those times that I have to ask God for that grace to forgive. There's times, I, as I don't think I'm alone in this with clergy, but you start getting envious of what God is doing in other people's ministry and wonder, well, why is God blessing them like that and not us? I feel better, more holy than they are. <laughs> we start doing those type of things, but then the Holy Spirit starts, starts having to deal with those issues. And maybe you've got different things in your life that, that you know are weaknesses, and you just say, God, I need your help. And he says, I'll give you the help of the Holy Spirit so that you can live this life as a person, as a follower of Christ. It does take that connection of prayer and connection with God as we allow God to nurture us and minister to our hearts. In Psalms 19, 14, it says, May the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be pleasing in your sight, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. Those are things that help us to follow the ways of God. And then the Apostle Paul points out that as we are doing these things, we will bear fruit. We will bear fruit in good works, in good deeds. We don't do good works to be a Christian. We do good works because we are a Christian. So we should desire to have the life of Christ bearing witness in our life. Are, we, are people seeing us as Jesus, loving, caring, helpful, healing, even self-sacrificing? In another of Paul's letters, he wrote for us some of that fruit that should be... Hi, Siri. Uh, you need to unlock your iPad first. Okay, thank you. <laughs> But in another of the passages, he wrote that what fruit needs to be in our life. Bobby actually gave me a t-shirt with this on it. So it's in Galatians 5, 22 through 23, because I 
do like this verse. For the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. These are things that should be developing in our life. This is the fruit that we bear, and the only way we can do it, we can't do it in ourselves. We can say, oh, I'm going to be patient, I'm going to be patient, because if you think you're going to be patient, you'll walk out the door and you'll realize you can't be patient. So we realize it's all on God, and that's why Jesus tells us in John 15, 4 and 5, remain in me and I will remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. If a man remains in me and I in him, he will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. Will we bear fruit in Christ, having Christ within our life? <laughs> Third, we grow in the knowledge, in our knowledge of God. That comes from our time of, of study, time of being in relationship with others, of learning who God is so that we can be led through the power of God. Do you have more knowledge of God today than you did a year ago? If not, why not? Are you continuing to seek after God and follow after God's will and direction? These are things then we realize, oh, if I'm going to grow, I should be in a different place this year than last year. I should have a better understanding. So as we get to even know someone in our life, we realize we start finding out different things about them. Some we might like less after knowing them, others we may like more. But with God, we need to start learning God more so we start learning more of who God is. And then the fourth thing the apostle tells us to do is that we're strengthened with the power of the Holy Spirit. That we'd be strengthened with the power of the Holy Spirit in our life. Now that includes that we will have endurance and patience. So we actually could count that as three different things rather than one, but power, endurance, and patience, he kind of fits under this one category. In this life, each of us will face things that we won't know how to handle. We don't know if we'll be able to stand it. But in our walk with God, through the power of the Holy Spirit, we are given that power to endure with patience. That's something only the Holy Spirit can give. And that word for power is dunamis, where we get the word for dynamite, meaning miraculous power. There are times things we face, we know it takes miraculous power of God because we see no other way for this thing to be fulfilled. And Paul states that we're strengthened with all power. God's complete power, he enables us to be able to stand. That strength that comes our way when we don't think we can stand. That power of the Holy Spirit that gives us endurance when we don't want to continue. When we don't want to go again, get up that next morning. When we see that person. When we have to face that situation. God gives us the ability when we don't have it within ourselves. And then he ends it by saying, and have joyful thanks. That these are the things that will flow out of our life. These are the results as we keep drawing closer to God is joyful thanks, which ties to our month of Thanksgiving. But the scripture says, the joy of the Lord is our strength. Doesn't mean we're going to be thrilled about everything that happens in our life. But we have that joy that we can't explain. First Peter, Peter wrote in 1 Peter 1 8, though you have not seen him, Jesus, you love him. And even though you do not see him now, you believe in him. So he's talking about us believers who haven't witnessed the resurrection of Christ personally, face to face, and are filled with an inexpressible and joyous joy. That inexpressible joy. That we may not understand how we can be happy. And it's not a thanks because we're forced to give thanks. It should flow out of our life. Many of us as kids had to say thank you for gifts we really weren't too thrilled about. Andy, thank you for that tie-dye shirt. We had to. But that's different than being truly thankful for what God has done. And it comes from knowing God and allowing God to work in our lives. So these are some of the great works that come as we get to know God, as we make the most of our walk with God. So the reason we should desire to live a life that's pleasing to the Lord is because of what God has done for us. God has rescued us from the kingdom of darkness and brought us in the kingdom of, of God through redemption and forgiveness of our sin. We research, well, what does it mean 
then God to walk after you? What is it about your will? So we learn about God's will through spending time in prayer, through spending time in the word. As we allow the Holy Spirit to overflow us with spiritual wisdom and understanding, and we begin to see things from God's perspective, how God has handled things in the past, knowing God will do that for us. And then as a result, of our walk with God, we start living a life that's worthy. I don't know that any of us will ever feel we live a life worthy of Christ giving his life for us, but we start making that progress where we start sensing God as at work in our life. We bear fruit. We start helping those around us. We grow in our knowledge of God. We're strengthened in all wisdom and power, endurance and patience, and so we joyfully give thanks to God for, for his work in our life. Who wouldn't want any of and if there were things as we went through this passage this morning that kind of stuck out to you, then I encourage you, talk to the Holy Spirit about that. Say, God, you know, I'm not sensing a thankful heart right now. I'm not very patient. These things are really starting to get to me. Can you take time before God and share those with God, knowing that the Holy Spirit will do a work within your life and all of those things? These things that the Apostle Paul has given to us is not to make us feel like, oh my gosh, I am so not there. It's to give us that courage to say, I can be there. To encourage us to take those next steps, to get closer to our walk with God, and as a result, making the most of our walk with God. Are we up for that challenge? Do we want more from God in our life? Let's pray. God, we... Thank you for the Apostle Paul and his words of encouragement that help us to see some very practical things, things that we've heard about all of our life, things that we know we're supposed to do. But God, even though we know we're supposed to pray and read the word and be with other believers and listen to our heart and observe circumstances around us to follow after where you want us to be in life, at times we're not always the best at those things. So God, I just ask that your Holy Spirit begin to minister to our hearts and to our lives to bring that encouragement, that sense of peace, that sense of thankfulness because we are so grateful that you rescued us and gave us such a much better life than we had. You've redeemed us and set us free so we're not under bondage or the power of sin over our life, that the result of sin has been dealt with, that death penalty that came with everything that happened according to the law of Moses has no power over us. It's been stripped away. So God, just encourage us in our walk with you. Help us to think of ways how we can know you more this next year than we did this past year. Help us, oh God, as we just listen to your voice and go before us as we take this walk of faith. In Jesus' name, amen. So at this time, we will take prayer requests. someone's needing to have a conversation with their mom about a trip they need to take and nervous about it so asking for God's guidance and need for that in their life um, are there other things that you're yeah Marty okay
God, we thank you that we can bring our requests before you, O oh God, and we thank you that you are there for us. We ask, O oh God, for Martin's friend, that you continue to give health and strength in her life, that you um, bring the support and uh, help she needs from friends and medical field, but also from your miracle working power in her life. God, as Monroe expressed his desire, just keep following you. God, I think there's several who would probably think, yeah, God, I can use that as well. Just to can you have you lead and guide and direct where we need to go and what needs to happen. God, for Jason and his eyes, we ask that you bring that continued healing. God, you know what needs to happen. You know um, what's going on in his system. You created him. You made him. And Lord, we know you know what's happening with his eyesight. And we ask for that healing power of Jesus that, that we are told by Jesus stripes, we are healed. And God, that healing applies to so many areas, but also into our physical being as well. So God, we ask that physical healing to take place in his life. And God, for Elijah's request for uh, the kitten he saw on the side of the road, and God, just his heart, his tender heart to the concern for this lost animal. And God, we know that there are several that animals that are um, feral, that are out there, that just, Lord, they're yours. You know about every bird in the air. You know how to take care of them. God, you said you can take care of all of us, and Lord, we pray for those animals as well, just to, to bring that um, discontinued um, homes and safety and food, whatever they may need. God, we also pray for uh, Brian for his conversation he has to have with his mom about a trip he has to take uh, that he's nervous about. God, you know the circumstances, you know the situation, you know what's happening there. So God, we ask that you uh, guide him, lead him, and give him the words to say, the way to say it, and Lord, just help her heart to be receptive. And God, we ask that, uh, that you just take care of her whenever he is away. God, we know there may be other needs in this room that weren't presented out loud, but God, you know what we're struggling with. And Lord, we want to take a moment and lay them at your feet. So congregation, if there are things in your life that you just want to put before God, take a moment now and do that. We thank you, O oh Lord. We thank you, O oh God, for the fact that we can lay before you our burdens and our cares, knowing that you care for us. So God, we ask all of this in Jesus' name. I'm sure he's going to come and get some cleanup. Good morning, everyone. So, um, first of all, we have been doing really well with our YouTube um, individuals joining, and we were up in the 80s. So, if you haven't done it yet, go ahead and sign in and subscribe so that. Uh, we can be accepted to uh, start using YouTube a little more freely. But great job on all of you who have signed up so far. Thank you. Thanksgiving Sunday, November 20th, potluck after service, which will be amazing. Um, bring side dishes, and um, if you want to bring a side dish that needs to stay warm, please bring it in a slow cooker or in a um, in something that will keep it warm. Anything you want to add, Bobby? Volunteer to cook that turkey, and I'm. Catherine's taking the turkey. Anybody for stuffings? Anybody for stuffing? Going once, twice. Okay. Catherine, you're our hero. <laughs> uh, deck the halls. Deck the halls. Uh, Saturday, December 3rd at 10 a.m. will be our Christmas decorating party. Everybody show up. We have a lot of fun doing it. And um, if we get a lot of people, we get done really quickly. 
So that's a Saturday, December 3rd, and that's 10 a.m. Let's see, what else do we have going on? Yes, we have the Christmas pageant coming up. That's on Friday, December 16th at 7 o'clock. If anybody has anything that they would like to perform um, at that Christmas pageant, please be in touch with Melissa. Okay, that will probably be fun. Also, uh, membership renewal is coming. Um, we have been in membership renewal. It will continue throughout the month. And I know th there was uh, maybe somebody that had a question about is membership, is there a charge for membership? No, membership is free. Um, so just uh, wanted to make that clear. And like I said, membership will be throughout the month. And Marcos has been sending emails out to everyone. If you didn't re receive one, maybe you might want to touch base with him and make sure that he has your email address. Oh, and he's coming after you. <laughs> so watch out. Here comes Marcos. <laughs> um, holiday, Saturday, Christmas pageant. Yoo -hoo. I think we got everything but offering today. Okay. If everybody could just bow their head in prayer, please. Oh, thank you, glorious Father, for this time that we spend with you today. Thank you for everything that you have given to us. And at this time of our offering, we will graciously be given back to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. The music team gets ready to sing us out.